It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. If we name our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we've forgotten. Therefore, it is our standard operating procedure that you spend the next few moments in silent prayer to be in fellowship. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Well, this is our second message, and why well, have two messages in the middle of a week? Because we need people to go to play Roma, that's why. We need people to grow in grace and in knowledge, and we need people to understand that Bible doctrine is number one. And I guarantee you there's nothing on television or nothing else more important than the Word of God. And that's why. It's not out of competition with anyone. It's out of the fact that we just need to grow in grace, all of us. And there needs to be an importance put on the Word of God, an importance that has been lost, an importance that has been lost among many doctrinal pastors even. I won't name any names, but they don't even teach enough to where it will make any difference in anyone's lives. They may learn a bit here and there, but unless they are supplementing their spiritual growth with the tapes of Colonel R.B. theme, or unless they're supplementing their growth by learning doctrine elsewhere, it's not going to work for them. They'll be spinning their wheels. It's a daily thing. Our spiritual life actually is a minute-by-minute thing. Are you filled with the Spirit this minute? Are you filled with the Spirit the next minute? Are you filled with the Spirit when you wake up? Probably not. Name your sins. Be filled with the Spirit. Are you filled with the Spirit in the middle of the day after you've gossiped? No. Be filled with the Spirit. So it's a daily thing. And we need to learn the Bible. It's a critical time in which to learn the Word of God. We need to to move quickly to Pleroma because if we don't, our nation will suffer. So far since 9-11, no major attack has occurred. I'm sure some small ones have been pushed under the table. But no major attack has occurred since 9-11. Why? There are just enough believers to keep it from happening. And maybe you can stand in the gap too. If you make Bible doctrine number one, maybe you are standing in the gap. Who knows? But what we're studying now is the inscrutable question. The inscrutable question. Some of you may have heard this before. Others others of you may have never heard it before. The inscrutable question. Colonel Thiem taught this right before Alzheimer's took him. And uh, it is absolutely phenomenal because we find out that there's no such thing as an inscrutable question when the Word of God deals with it. So point one. Many biblical students, many theological students, have asked the question, What type of redemption solution was available for Satan and the fallen angels? That was their question. And they figured, and rightly so, they figured to themselves, the human race has a redemption redemption solution. Why not Satan and the fallen angels? Did they have any type of redemptive solution? Many theologians have come to conclude, yes, they did, but there's no biblical solution foundation for that whatsoever. Absolutely not. And no one has really ever properly answered this question except my pastor. Instead they come up with the answer it's inscrutable. And the word inscrutable means not easily understood. Well that might be true. It is not easily understood. It takes study and study and study and study. It's something that is not easily understood. But also it means something that's unfathomable. Unfathomable. But that's not true. Because we can fathom it and we will understand it. They also say it is incomprehensible and undiscoverable. 
And that's not true because it has been discovered and it is in the Bible. And there's really a common sense answer to the whole thing. So what type of redemption, redemption solution did Satan and the fallen angels have? That's the question. The answer? None! The angels, the fallen angels and Satan have no and had no redemptive solution. And there's some pretty common sense answers as to why not. Now this is theology what we're studying now. It'd be very boring to some people who are more interested in geometry. But the answer is none. They had no redemptive solution. There was no redemption solution in eternity past with regard to Satan or the fallen angels. The angels did have something they had to believe in order to be elect angels. But remember, they all started elect. They were all elect. Satan started out as an elect angel, the highest ranking of elect angels. All the fallen angels started out as elect angels. The thing is volition. That's the whole crust or the whole peak of the whole situation is volition. The fallen angels knew what the consequences would be for their decision to follow Satan. God told them the consequences. God said, you follow Satan, you will be sentenced to the lake of fire. God told them that before they made that decision. God told them the consequences, but they rejected it. And they said, I don't believe that. Just as people reject Bible doctrine today and say, I don't believe that. That's not the way I was raised. You are not being proper as a pastor. You are not doing what is appropriate. Therefore, I will not believe what you say. Arrogance! And that is what Satan and the fallen angels fell into. Arrogance! They were right. God was wrong. And that's the way they thought of it. And he gave them the consequences before they even made this decision. They were all elect. Now the fallen angels knew what the consequences of their decision would be. And they knew that they would go to the lake of fire and share in Satan's judgment in the lake of fire if they decided to follow Satan. Why? God told them that. Now the Bible never ever associates redemption with the fall of Satan as an alternative solution. Or the fallen angels. He never, in the Bible, there is never an alternative solution for the, the fallen angels or Satan. And that's because all angelic creatures, and this is an important point, all angelic creatures were created perfect, with perfect volition. Those are two things that are important. The most important I'll tell you in a moment. Because all angelic creatures were created perfect with perfect volition. And this is the most important. And eternal life. All elect angels started with eternal life. Adam and Eve did not start with eternal life. They started with perfect life. They did not have eternal life. They were created perfect, Adam and Eve. But they did not have eternal life. They had perfect life. And they had a decision to make in which they could fall from that perfect life. But Adam and Eve never had eternal life. It was never guaranteed to Adam and Eve that they would live forever and ever and ever. There was a condition given to them. There was never a condition given to Satan. Satan started out perfect with eternal life. And there was no condition to it. Adam started with perfect life with a condition. You will maintain this perfect life, this innocent life, as long as you do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So immediately we see the difference between angels and how they started and human beings and how we started. 
Now, of course, Adam and Eve had the upper hand where we don't. And God has already provided for all of that. So the Bible does not associate redemption with Satan as an alternative solution. And we'll actually look at a verse that tells us this. It's in the Bible. It's not inscrutable. Turn in your Bibles to Colossians 1.13. We will go from Colossians 1.13 through 1.16. We will exegete this passage. That is Colossians 1.13 through 16. For he delivered us from the authority of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of, of, of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. This is all referring to Jesus Christ. Because by agency of him, Jesus Christ, all things were created. Jesus Christ actually created the earth, the universe, you and me. Because by agency of him, all things were created in the heavens. What, that, what does that refer to? Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, created the angels. You might have thought God the Father did it. No, it was Jesus Christ who created the angels. All things that were created in the heavens, angels, and on earth, mankind, Jesus Christ created us. Visible, referring to mankind, and invisible, referring to angels. Whether thrones or angelic powers or ruler angels or, now this is corrected translation and I'll show you why in a moment, or angels with the right to decide. Corrected translation. Whatever your Bible says is wrong. These are angels that Jesus Christ created and it is described in Colossians as angels who have the right to decide. I doubt one of your Bibles says that. If it does, hallelujah, we found a genius. All things have been created through him, Jesus Christ, and for him, Jesus Christ. Now, how do we know this is right? Well, first of all, we need to note some Greek words. Point one, there's the Greek word thronos. T-H-R-O-N-O-S. Thronos. T-H-R-O-N-O-S. And this is the name of a class of supernatural beings. Angels. Thronos refers to angels. You may say thronos. Thronos refers to angels. Now in the phrase in Isaiah 14, 13, Satan says, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. Now the word throne in the Hebrew is the word kese. K-E-S-S-E. -S -S -E, kese. And we have one in the Greek, thronos, and we have one in the Hebrew, kese. And it refers to angels, angelic beings. Where you read stars in Isaiah 14, 13, it's referring to angels. You see what happens is people go ahead and transliterate instead of trying to figure out the idiom of the day. And we have idioms today, idioms for idiots, but there are idioms out there. And we use idioms. And you have to understand the idioms of a foreign language before you can actually translate it correctly. For example, we might say, your head is too large. Or you have a fat head is what we might say. Now you translate that into a, another uh, language literally, and you know what they'll think of? A person with a big fat swollen head. They won't think of arrogance, but we will because it's an idiom. But if you were in uh, France and you were to say that person has a fat head in their language, 
They would look at that person and say, no, he looks like John Kerry and has a horse's face. He does not have a fat head. <laughs> that was a fake laugh, too. But anyway, <laughs> uh-uh. <laughs> anyway, that's an idiom. And you have to understand idioms before you can ever come to understand any language. If you're studying Spanish, you've got to learn their idioms or you'll be lost. So, quesé, it's, uh, it's figurative, uh, figuratively used for rulership. And Satan revolts against the eternal rulership of God in rebellion. Now, the Greek word, kuriotes, K-U-R-I-O-T-E-S, that refers to a special class of angelic powers. All of these words are found in the verses we just noted. Curiotes refers to a special class of angelic powers. And uh, this verse describes all the different angels. Now let's look at Archai. A-R-C-H-A-I. And that refers to a special class of ruler angels. The Greek word Archai. A-R-K- A-R-C-H-A-I A-R-C-H-A-I refers to a special class of ruler angels. Now, the important thing we need to note is this part, this last part where it says whether thrones or angelic powers or ruler angels or angels with the right to decide. That's the corrected translation and this is where we get it from. We get it from the Greek word exousia. E-X-O-U-S-I-A. E-X-O-U-S-I-A. The word authorities, as it might appear in your Bible, is an incorrect translation. The Greek word exousia means freedom of choice. That means that Jesus Christ was the ruler of angels who had a right to decide volition. God would not be God if he didn't give his creatures volition. He gave them freedom. God loves freedom and he gives all of his creatures freedom. He gave the angelic creatures freedom. He gives us freedom. And some people often overthink and say, well, why did God create angels when he knew from omniscience a third of them would fall? And why would he go through all of this thing? Why would he even, even go to the cross? Well, when you question God in that way, you don't understand his absolute perfection. And you don't understand his character. And you don't understand his integrity. And you don't understand his love for freedom. God loves freedom. Now, if God wanted to create robots, he could have created robots. Couldn't he have? You say you do this and they do it, you do that and they do it. Most of us, in our thinking, would create robots. You do this for me. Vacuum my floor. Shampoo my floor. Turn the television. Get me some ice cream. Do this, do that, do the other. Go to the store. And we would use creatures. But God and His perfection is no user. He loves freedom. And He loves His creatures that He creates so much from His integrity that He gives them freedom. That shows the value of freedom in our lives that we've forgotten as Americans. The only reason we're blessed is because our Constitution gives us lots of freedoms and God nods his head at that and says, that's right. That's part of my divine establishment. I love freedom. Therefore, you should love freedom. The Israelites didn't love freedom. What did they say? Let us go back to slavery. God loves freedom. That's part of his character. And for you to question that and to say, why would God create this and that just to have them go astray? Because God loves freedom. It's part of his character. Why create it in the first place? Well, we don't know God's thinking exactly. He thinks way above and beyond what we could ever think. Just don't question it, though, or you'll be up a creek. 
So the word authorities is an incorrect translation. The Greek word exousia means freedom of choice. It means the angels had a right to decide in eternity past. And the right to decide was directed toward redemption as with the human race. That means they didn't have a redemptive solution, but right there they had a right to decide. Just as we as people who are born into spiritual death, we have a right to decide for Christ, believe in Christ, or against Christ, reject Christ. The difference is we start in spiritual death. The angels started with eternal life. Who had the advantage? The angels. Therefore, they have no need for a redemptive solution. We start with a disadvantage. Spiritual death. And it wouldn't be fair if we didn't have a spiritual solution. Because we were born into this world. And God gave us a soul the moment we popped out from the womb. God gave us a soul out from the womb. Ek plus koilea. It's in the Bible. Out from the womb God gave us a soul. And then... It would not be fair to be born into spiritual death without a solution to it. it. just wouldn't be fair. And since God is fair, he's given us a redemptive solution. But the angels started perfect. And with eternal life. And if you start with eternal life, you've started with the upper hand. We don't start with that. We start with everlasting life. And there's a difference. We start with everlasting life. Our soul will last forever. But we do not start with eternal life. And there is a difference. It might sound technical, and it is technical. Everlasting life means our soul goes on forever and ever, no matter what. If we reject Christ, our soul goes on forever and ever, everlasting. If we accept Christ, we receive eternal life. In that sense, Adam had everlasting life, but not eternal life. It's technical, but very important for us to understand. So let's now look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 through 12. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12. This is where we pick up little bits and pieces of what happened to the angels? And why did the fallen angels not have a redemptive solution? Why not? Because God is fair and they didn't need it. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12. Put on the full armor from God that you might always be able to stand your ground against the strategies of the devil. What's that? Against the cosmic system. It's not saying Satan is attacking you directly. It's saying watch out for his strategies. Satan usually attacks no one directly except, excuse me, those who have gone the full root of their spiritual life. Satan usually messes with no one individually. Why? He's too busy with his strategy. He's too busy with getting the majority of the world on his side. And he's done a damn good job at it. And the majority of the world is on his side. Might not be proper for a pastor to say, damn, but I don't care. We've noted what is proper and what is improper. And we've noted how Satan likes to go with what is proper. Besides, this legalism that has creeped through the ages, needs to be crept through the ages, needs to be wiped out. And the fastest way to kick a legalist out is to say something offensive. If they were positive, they would stick with him and say, well, let's listen anyway. Put on the full armor of, from God. And I tell you that from experience. I have been insulted by a pastor. 
I've been insulted by my pastor. Did I quit? No. Why? There's a difference between those who are humble and those who are arrogant. And I guarantee you that some of the people... You see, every time I went to see my pastor for a while, he chewed me out. Just something about me. <laughs> something he didn't like. I didn't care. I liked him and I liked what he was saying. I hold it against him? Absolutely not. Did I go up and make an issue after class and say, Man, why are you yelling at me? Who do you think you are? No! And it was personal. He looked at me personally straight in the eye and chewed the hell out of me. Did I make a personal issue out of it? No. Why not? Humility. Something that people do not understand today. They'll never understand it. Why? We have reached a pinnacle of arrogance in this country. And we are going under as a country. We are falling apart. No briefcase needed again. We are falling apart as a nation. Why do I say that? No briefcase. Somebody listen to me and say, what the heck are you talking about a briefcase? My pastor was so tough on people that uh, when they got sick, he would he would make an issue out of it. I mean, he didn't know they were sick, but he'd make an issue out of it. And he would say, uh, young woman, why are you getting up, etc.? What do you need to why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why are you leaving? In other words, don't move while I'm teaching. And uh somebody said, Well, I'm sick. And, okay, well go ahead if you're sick. But one guy got so sick and he was so terrified of the colonel, he just opened up his briefcase while the colonel was teaching, threw up in his briefcase, shut it, and kept listening. Now that might be a bit too tough, but who am I to say? Ephesians six eleven to 12 Put on the full armor from God that you might always be able to stand your ground against the strategies of the devil, the cosmic system. Because our warfare is not against blood and flesh, but against ruler angels, that is, demon general officers. But against ruler angels, demon general officers. Against authorities, Demon Officer Core against authorities. Demon Officer Core against the demon world rulers of this darkness. Against the spiritual forces of evil. Rank and file demons. Average demons. E1, etc. In the heavenly places, that is the atmosphere around the earth. We'll study heaven one day. There's the heaven around the earth, and then there's the heaven in heaven in which there's different categories there so at the fall of Satan all angels made a decision to follow God or to follow Satan and that resulted in two categories of angelic creatures there were those angels who rejected the temptation to follow Satan and they remained faithful to God and they're called elect and there are those angels who rejected God and followed Satan and they are called fallen or the angels of demons all angels were created perfect at the same time, that's important. Write that down. All angels were created perfect. And the important thing, at the same time. You'll note why that's important in a moment. All angels were created perfect and at the same time. And with eternal life. Mankind was not created with eternal life. Everlasting life, yes. Eternal life, no. Angels were created at the same time, which is something we, important we need to note later. They had eternal life before Satan's fall, and they had eternal life after making their decision to follow Satan. All angels made their decision in eternity past when Satan fell. Now only two human beings were created perfect. This is where we start our study. There are only two perfect human beings, Adam and Eve. None of us were never born perfect. We were never created perfect. Adam and Eve 
were created perfect. And that's it. Just Adam and Eve. No one else. And what and the importance of knowing this is, remember, at the same time, God created the angels, all of them, at the same time. God did not create all of humanity at the same time. What we have here is a trial. The beginning of a trial. Satan says, God, you've wronged me. Let's have an appeal trial. And God says, okay, from his justice. And he says, I will prove to you my perfect justice. And I will prove to the world my perfect justice. And so he creates mankind to resolve the angelic conflict. And what you need to note is that there were billions and billions of angels. Billions of fallen angels. Billions of elect angels. And then came on the scene what? Two human beings. Now how in the world can you have two witnesses execute a trial? Two witnesses. When there's, on the other side, on the side of Satan, there's billions of witnesses, fallen angels. Billions of fallen angels. And so God brings onto the scene two witnesses of his own, Adam and Eve. Just two. Not billions, just two. And he doesn't create humanity at the same time, and that's important, especially when it comes to understanding courtroom procedure. There's not just two witnesses. If the defense has a billion witnesses, the prosecution has a right to also have a billion witnesses. Not just two. Not just two witnesses. But that's how it started. And God started simply with two witnesses, Adam and Eve, created in perfection. So all the angels were created perfect at the same time and only two human beings were created perfect ever. Only two human beings were ever created perfect. So the issue was clear to the angels in the fall of Satan. Either eternal life with God or eternal life with Satan. That was the issue with the angels. You're either going to have eternal life. You already have eternal life. Your choice now is eternal life with God or eternal life with Satan. A third of them chose eternal life with Satan. Therefore, no redemption solution was needed for fallen angels because they were not only created perfect, but with eternal life. And they had to choose for God or for Satan. So they didn't need a redemption solution. And Christ did not die for the angels in any sense of the word because they were already created perfect and with eternal life and since they are now get this down since the angels already had eternal life why would they need it get that down and think about it it's going to be hard to really sift through it because this is spiritually discerned the angels already have eternal life. Therefore, why do they need it? What does the Bible say in John 3.16? God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born son so that whosoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. What could Jesus Christ give to the angels that they did not already have? Do you understand? The angels already had eternal life. What could Jesus Christ give them? Nothing. They did not have a redemptive solution. But we didn't start out with eternal life. We are born spiritually dead. We have everlasting life with our souls. Our souls go on forever and ever. But we don't have eternal life. There is a difference and it's a technical difference. It's one that the English language doesn't even portray. It only comes out in the Greek. But it's something that you can discern from the filling of God the Holy Spirit. So just think about it. The angels have eternal life, therefore they don't need it. Therefore they don't need a redemptive solution. We don't have eternal life when we start out, therefore we need one. It's as simple as that. So the conclusion is, there was no redemptive solution for the angels, the fallen angels or Satan. And it's completely fair. They made a choice from eternal life and perfection. 
We make a choice from spiritual death as part of the witnesses for the prosecution. So the issue was clear to all the fallen angels and to Satan. You either pick eternal life with God or eternal life with Satan. One third of the angels followed Satan. No redemption solution was needed for this, uh, for this because they were all created perfect and with eternal life. And they had, and uh, 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 one third chose for Satan, two thirds chose for God. So all of the angels had to make the same decision that Adam made when he faced the fallen woman. Now there is some similarity here. There is some similarity, but the similarity breaks at some point, and we will note that. And the reason why theologians go off on this tangent of well, the angels had to have a solution is because they look at Adam and Eve and follow it all the way through. But that's they don't understand the verses we just studied and how God gave them free will, the angels. So all the angels made the same decision that Adam made when he first faced the fallen woman. But remember, the fallen woman was deceived. So Adam had to decide between the fallen woman and Jesus Christ. The fallen woman outside the garden and Jesus Christ. So Adam follow, follows the pattern. Eve doesn't. Adam follows the pattern. Adam had a choice to make. Follow God or follow Eve outside the garden. Who was an agent of Satan, by the way, by this point which we've studied. Follow God or follow Eve. Follow God or follow Satan. That was Adam's choice. But remember, Eve was ignorant and totally deceived. The angels were never ignorant! They knew what they were doing. Every single one of those angels knew what they were doing. Just as Adam knew what he was doing. But the woman did not know what she was doing. She was utterly deceived. All the angels knew what they were doing. You might say, well, Satan deceived a third of the angels. They knew what they were doing. They were no more deceived than Adam was deceived. They made a choice. I follow God or I follow Satan. And a third of the angels looked at Satan and said, he's so beautiful, he has the voice of a pipe organ, he has such a wonderful personality, I follow Satan instead of God. And Adam looked at Eve and said, She's so beautiful. She's got the finest breast in the world. She is the most beautiful creature on earth. I follow her instead of God. He made the same choice the angels made. But Eve didn't. Eve was deceived. Totally, utterly deceived. And there's a total difference here. It's very technical, but there's a total difference in what happened. So Adam did follow the woman outside of the garden. And then he had to make the choice um, uh, for himself. After that, actually a redemption solution was given. Now it appears this may be out of order, but anyway, it is out of order. Well, let's, uh, well I, don't need, I don't need papers. I know about this. Let me tell you about this uh, just uh, free for all now. We started with two witnesses, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, two witnesses, created perfect, without eternal life, but having everlasting life. Now the angels started out perfect with eternal life. And they chose either for God or against God. Adam did the same thing. He chose for God or against God. As a result, we have such verses as, Did Adam all die? Because he made the cognizant choice, just as the angels did. So in Adam and all die, not in Eve. In Adam all die, but in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, this is the difference. Remember, I told you that all the angels were created at the same time. The very same time. You could say simultaneously, but they all appeared at the same time. Jesus Christ, as it were, snapped his fingers and billions of angels appeared. 
And billions of angels appeared with the choice with volition. And then Satan one day got a fat head. And Satan said, I'll be like the Most High God. Now a third of the angels had eternal life. And they could have followed God with their eternal life or they could follow Satan with their eternal life. A third of them followed Satan. In the same manner, a third of the human race will follow Satan in the millennium. Which just shows that a perfect environment really doesn't change anything. But keeping on track here, there were two witnesses, Adam and Eve. Now Satan begins this trial. You know what he said when he fell and God said, I sent it you to the lake of fire. Well, the first argument Satan came up with was this. How could a loving God send his own creatures to the lake of fire? And he says, I appeal. I make an appeal. And God, being fair and just, said, all right, we'll have an appeal trial. Besides, I will be able to demonstrate my fairness, my justice, and my perfection through this appeal trial. So yes, I accept. We will have an appeal trial. Now in that trial, it started out that Satan took a third of the angels with him. That's how it started. And then God said, all right, well, I'm going to make a lower creation with volition. Just as you have volition, I make a lower creation with volition. You see, the angels are super geniuses, all of them. The elect angels and the fallen angels are super geniuses. Even the embodied demons who have a lower IQ than all the other demons have a far higher super genius than we do. All super geniuses. And so God looked at Satan and said, All right, I'll, I'm going to prove to you something. I'm going to prove to you, Satan, that it's not environment. It's volition. And I'm going to prove it to you because I'm going to create a lower form of the human race that's called the human race, a lower form with an intelligence far, far lower than you. The, uh, compare, the uh, To be comparable with it, I guess it would be like saying humans to rabbits, except a rabbit would have volition. But uh, for them, it was angels to humans. And the angels actually look at us in our inferior form. They probably even like to laugh at us sometimes in our inferior form. But we have volition! And that's the one thing they notice. Volition. And so, the angels look down at Adam and Eve with their volition. And they watch them. Two witnesses. Just two. And they watch them fail. They watch two witnesses fail. But guess what? There are billions and billions of angelic creatures. Therefore, we need more defense witnesses. Right? You can't just, uh, if you're going to be a good defense attorney, you don't have two witnesses while the other person has a million. If you're a good one. And so God in his genius started out with just two. And he said, all right, you won with just two. But now, people will be born. Now this is really what gets to Satan. People will be born in spiritual death. This is what gets to Satan because Satan was born in spiritual life with eternal life. And God looks at Satan and says, Now, Satan, let me show you something. Every human being from now on will be born into spiritual death. Where you started with eternal life, they will start with eternal condemnation. And he said, And now they will be given a choice. And they can believe in Christ who redeems them. And why do we need a redeemer? Because all of us are born into spiritual death. Satan wasn't. We are. We need a redemption solution. Satan did not. Neither did the fallen angels. We need a redemptive solution. And God provides it for us. And then he says to Satan, All right, here's volition. You see these creatures... These stupid creatures with IQs, a tenth of what your is, or a hundredth, or maybe a millionth of what yours is. Probably a millionth. You see these creatures with an IQ of a millionth of your IQ? They're making choices for Jesus Christ. 
They are making a choice for eternal life. Even though they start in spiritual death with no eternal life. That just puts a nail right through Satan's coffin right there. He's lost. He's so arrogant he doesn't know it, but he's lost. He's lost this battle. He's lost this war. And it's that simple. Now the angels do observe the human race. And uh, I may just close now because this is a whole other subject and besides there was more to it. Well here it is. This is the way it... Uh, I actually just had the uh, pages turned around. So theology wants to push uh, past this point and say that, well, Satan had to have a redemption solution and so did the angels because human beings do. But they fail to understand the angelic conflict and they fail to understand the trial and how it's functioning. If you start with eternal life, you don't need a solution. If you start in spiritual death, you need a solution. Satan never needed a solution. He started out perfectly. And you say, well, what about Adam, who started out with perfect life? He was saved. Now, Satan will use that argument. He will say, all right, you were right there. There were some idiots who believed in Christ. I see that. But when it came to Adam, he made the same choice I did, yet he's going to heaven. Why is that? And the answer is simple. He started with perfect life, not eternal life. He started with everlasting, perfect life, not eternal life. So Satan always, Satan and the fallen angels always had a, what would you say, a step up on the human race. They were above the human race in every way. They were ahead of the human race. They didn't need what we need. And so God allowed Adam to believe in Christ and be saved. Why? He didn't start with eternal life. So Adam believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was credited to his account for righteousness and he received eternal life for the first time when he believed in Christ. Satan had eternal life when he was created. That's the difference. And that's why Satan and the fallen angels need no redemptive solution. Might be hard to follow. When my pastor first taught it, I knew that the thousands of people listening to him weren't going to get a thing out of it and they weren't going to understand it. And then people tried to uh, explain it themselves. Finally he got fed up and said, Stop trying to explain this. I'm the only one who's going to be able to explain this to you. Well, maybe I can do it too. But you need to understand they didn't need a redemptive solution. And that is theology for you. You see, most Baptist churches, they won't be talking about theology. They're closed tonight anyway. We should raid a Baptist church and use it. I'm just joking. But they're not open except on Sunday. Just raid one one night. I'm preaching here. Hey, police. No, that's wrong. I'm joking. It's a, never mind. Anyway, that is how it goes with the redemptive solution. If you have any questions about it, you can ask. And I'll make sure to talk about it tomorrow because if you have a question, anyone else who listens has those same questions. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May we come to understand these things of Satanology. And may we come to understand your grace and how you've given us a gracious, gracious solution in faith alone in Christ alone and how actually we've been given what angels have never had. We ask these things in the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.